I got interested in this topic because I, I don't recall ever having a talk about laughter in medical school or neurology residency. And it turns out at, the more you look into it and the more you, you think about it, the more interesting it gets. So let me see if I can convey some of that enthusiasm over the next 45 minutes or so. And at the end of this, uh, Jim Bowen's going to be talking briefly about the NeuroNext program here at Swedish as well. So we're going to watch some videos, uh, not all 45 minutes, but some of it. We're going to develop some models of why we laugh and the anatomies of laughter. And we're going to review some of the patients that I've seen and worked with who've had issues with laughter. Uh, that help us illustrate some of those anatomies and laugh networks. And I wanted to start with a video of my son, Jack. And m there's a few of you here who've met Jack, but he's nonverbal. He's 13. In, in this video, he's 13. He's 14 now. But he laughs a lot. And the video shows him laughing. And what I want you to do in the video when you're watching it, as an epilepsy doc, I want you to count. We love counting. We love frequencies. Now what I want you to do is count when the video slows down into the slow-mo part of it. I want you to count how many laughs he has in his breath here. <laughs> Where's that big blue ball? <laughs> so it's slowed down now. So I'm not going to play hours of that. But basically, what you hear there is slow-mo laughter. But the cycles of laughter within each breath, it's in expiration only. And there's about five, maybe six cycles in his pretty standard laugh there. We're playing a game where I'm trying to steal that big ball from him. And he loves that game. And uh, I study Jack, as a parent does, in terms of thinking, well, why can he laugh but not speak? And, that's one of the things that, um, that interests me in this talk. Let's, let's move on from that, though. Laughter is remarkably stereotyped. And for humans, there's typically a fixed ratio of laughs per breath. And we're rather unique in that, and especially among animals and mammals, that uh, we can project uh, during exhalation multiple sounds per breath. Typically, it's around 5 hertz. And if you think about that, well, later we can project multiple words per breath. Or, for instance, when we're running, we can have multiple strides per breath. So we can fit in a lot in between each breath, whereas most mammals cannot. Quadrupeds, for instance, um, have loads borne by their front legs that impact their thorax's ability to relax. So when you're having an alternating gait as a quadruped, um, you can't use that time to breathe to express vocalizations. You're just panting. It's one stride, one breath. We're rather unique in being able to have far more strides, far more laughs, far more vocalizations per breath. This uh, ability to laugh is by and large involuntary. And, you know, in the Bible, there's John chapter 1, verse 1 is, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God. But it turns out, before the beginning, there's actually laughter. We're going to go through that. You need laughter to help build a structure or grammar for speaking and language. So let's talk about developmentally, what happens in infantile brains. Um, this First line is a direct quote from Dr. Sotero, Marcio Sotero, our pediatric neurology director. At two months, kids start to smile because of a fart smile. I think that's fairly self-explanatory, but um, I'll leave that up to you. They begin to track at two months. They cry in response to boredom at two months. They start ingesting soft foods at three months, begin to sleep through the night. They laugh at month four, typically, on the developmental milestones well prior to babbling, and well prior to stranger anxiety, and well prior to any language, which occurs about six months later. Typically, the first words occur. 
So if you think about it, well, okay, so four months, what's happening? Myelination patterns are by and large moving posterior to anterior and sticking with midline structures. So laughter mechanisms must involve midline structures that key down ultimately to respiratory regulation. Uh, so the midline and brainstem is intimately involved, and it's intimately involved with timing mechanisms, getting a set number of laughs per breath, for instance. So you think of timing mechanisms. Which timing mechanisms are midline? Well, hypothalamus, thalamus, uh, those are some of the few. Um, so early on, the myelination, the development of laughter, by and large, is involuntary. Um, and involves irrational pathways. As we age and mature and our myelination patterns begin to extend out into our memory generation and retrieval centers, as well as our attention centers, we begin to laugh at things that are more sophisticated and more associative or rational. So what else happens at four months? This is a very standard, um, anyone who's done an EEG rotation has knows this curve is basically looking at the posterior dominant background rhythms of an EEG. And in an adult, there's 10 cycles per second typically um, in a posterior electrode pair that um, is normal. That 10 cycles per second is achieved over time during childhood, but at four months, we start to see a continuous EEG pattern develop that is initially slow around 45 hertz, but this is the corruption then of an infantile pattern of, of discontinuous EEG becomes continuous at four months. The child begins to transition more effectively between sleep and wake states and uh, shows far less desynchronization on the EEG. So we see more of sine wave patterns and less corruption with delta and flattening and spikes and things that are normal variants for kids under the age of four months. What else happens four to six months? The splenium of the corpus callosum begins myelination, followed by the genu. The EEG amplitudes begin to ascend, so the shape and the morphology of the EEG wave gets larger. Non-REM sleep stages develop, uh, and we develop our occipital abilities to see. So we as electrophysiologists can measure that as a P1 latency. You give a stimulus to a visual field and you put an electrode on the back of the head and you can see a stimulus appear measured time linked to that uh, exposure in the back part of the head which implies the signal is reaching the occipital lobe meaning that the myelination pathways are complete between the eyeball and the retina to the back part of the head. So kids at age four to six months can start assigning values to what they see. They can start identifying objects and assigning a value to them. The rooting reflex goes away. And interestingly, in terms of our epilepsy population, this is the time, age four to six months, when we first start seeing infantile spasms, which are one of the more horrific types of epilepsy, extraordinarily hard to treat, that involve tonic stiffening and then collapse, uh, often associated with tuberous sclerosis, but not limited to that. This schematic just shows a comparison between a six-week infant on top and an adult in terms of white matter tracks and what's happening during this time frame. And it's probably not worth getting caught up in the details, but over on the right, these association pathways through the arcuate fasciculus leading from the temporal, occipital, and then projecting anteriorly are much more robust than when they are um, in the adult. So infants have myelination patterns that are different to us, and we change our myelination patterns. It's not as though we're continuously myelinating more and more things. We actually, as we get older, start eroding or losing some of those pathways and concentrating on ones that are more important. But for an infant, this sort of framework allows sensory inputs to be interpreted by frontal fields specifically in terms of is this a threat or not? Is the stimulus I'm appreciating an oral or a visual stimulus? Is that a threat or not? And do I need to react to it? I'll show you that more in terms of some videos in just a minute. So why do we laugh at so young an age? What survival advantage does it have? First of all, the easy answer was it helps us bond with our infant and vice versa. 
it's also age independent. Infants will laugh with one another. Uh, they will pick up cues from anything that's uh, reasonably funny and, and interesting to look at. It's not an age dependent bonding. It's a marker of engagement. And as we talked about before, it's really beginning a pattern of vocalization and breathing that permits later language development. So we're going to watch some videos. So th th <laughs> this was so much fun to prepare. The, uh, watching YouTube videos of, of babies laughing is really adorable. And what I wanted to do was a little bit of a stunt here. I wanted everyone to stand up because I want to see if there's an aspect of contagious laughter that if you laugh when we see these pictures of kids, I want you to go ahead and sit back down. Because one of the unique things about laughter, like yawning or itching or crying, is it's a contagious behavior. You see someone laughing, oftentimes you want to laugh too. So the first thing we're going to look at is a pair of kids who start laughing and sort of driving each other on, and then later on, You'll see parents typically, uh, you'll hear parents giving a stimulus to a child, and then the child trying to decide, is this a threat or is it not? If it's not, therefore, I'm going to laugh. So why don't you all stand up, uh, if you can. Um, we'll play along here a little bit. You ready? What's that? No, don't try and suppress. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to outthink you here. It's just, uh, uh, is it is it a of a uh, contagious nature or not. So let's look at this little guy here. This one, whoops, let me go backwards here a second. Uh, one of these kids here, bear with me. <laughs> about after this little guy. The next baby, um, you can see this fear threat response and determining is this going to hurt me or is it hilarious? It's really marked and just a beautiful example. <laughs> I, I promise you, if you're feeling down on a day after work and you want to get cheered up, watching these kids laugh is just hilarious. But So the, the children there are responding to threat and laughing when they're determining that it's not going to hurt them. So and as we age, and these are some kids who are about 13 months old, as we age, the laughter sort of changes a little bit and becomes more sophisticated and helps act as punctuation. So the, the previous... Uh, video showed punctuation for the threat. The laugh acknowledges that this is not dangerous. As these kids age, the laugh helps punctuate ideas that are delivered between the kids here. And you'll see that the child on the left demonstrate to the child on the right in a prosodic manner, but not with words. It'll sound like language. It'll have the feel of language. But importantly, there's no words passed here. And the other child reacts and laughs. It looks like they're having a conversation unique to them. This, this, the other things you'll notice in this video is the kids mimic one another. They move their hands like the other guy. They stomp their feet like the other one. So they're patterning behavior off one another that has helped given a grammatic framework with the laugh that helps define blocks of ideas. So let's take a look at that. This is adorable. You've probably seen this video. It's just unbelievable.
see them mimicking one another. You can see them interacting. You can see one child pausing and letting the other one take a turn. You can see a laugh encapsulating a block of content. And uh, you can see that they're, they're having a kid's version or an infant's version or a toddler's version of a conversation there. Clearly no language, though. So this is pre-language, but yet if you were an alien landing on Earth, you would think this was language. Oops. All right, this is also how I feel when, when I get my performance reviews, by the way. Um, so laughter at this age is, is a form of punctuation. It's involuntary. It precedes prosody. It's contagious. In kids, that's particularly hardwired. I don't know if probably most of you as a child can remember some scenarios in grade school where you could not stop laughing despite uh, the teacher or others telling you to quit it. Maybe it was your, your brother or parents. Or th that kind of contagious inability to suppress it is really rather unique and, and fascinating neurologically to me. Laughter is likely integral to the priming of mirror neurons. So it helps uh, with that contagious aspect. Mirror neurons are, are thought to be, uh, they're probably not unique cells, but it's more of a mirrored behavior where one person does one thing, you can't help but want to do it yourself. And it's probably one of the ways we help pattern, repeat, and establish pathways that help us learn. Meaning mirrored behaviors help us practice what we need to in terms of motor, speech, interaction, language, etc. Extraordinarily important. And this becomes extraordinarily important when we think about disease states where mirrored behaviors are absent, specifically with autism. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So what about as we age? As we age, the myelination begins to spread laterally into memory and association cortex. And that gives us the ability to laugh at a more robust range of stimuli. So I, this isn't from any textbook. This was me just kind of piecing out, well, as we get older, what sort of Piaget stages on the left versus humorous things in the middle versus neurologic processes on the right what sort of things happen? And this middle part, if you look through, I, these were my hierarchy of what was funny. And this is very unique and, and <laughs> independent. Like, you may find fart jokes and flatus and knock-knock jokes extraordinarily funny as an adult, but most of us probably don't. I asked my wife, when do fart jokes stop becoming funny? And she said, for a man, never. For a woman, <laughs> about age four, 14 or so. Anyway. Uh, Visual and oral stimuli greet, uh, cause laughter early. Social greetings, interactions, the idea of an idea of punctuation, surprise as we get older, jack-in-the-box type toys as an infant, uh, ages, knock-knock uh, jokes. As we get older into grade school, slapstick, clowning, parody. Uh, and as we get more capable of rational and associative ideas and abstract thoughts, things like situational comedy, satire, farce, agenda-based, and perhaps for physicians and providers, this last one, pathos, or humor with pity and sorrow mixed in. This is one where interactions with patients can feel somewhat assuaged by how you relate to the hard issues that they're suffering. So it's not easy coming in being sick and seeing your doctor who's super serious. If you can find the fine line between the pity and humor and sorrow and help, that sort of humor is rather sophisticated and can be a really useful tool in building a relationship with your patient. Anyway, what else happens? Myelination pathways, EEG changes, demyelination in some of those arcuate fasciculi and other cingulate gyri, and sex hormone-driven maturational pathways as we move into adolescence, adulthood. So getting older. In grade school, much of about 50% of the kids' laughter is nonverbal. What do we mean by that? So we all think of laughter as chuckling out loud, but a lot of laughter occurs with, uh, with grade, kids, grade school kids when you just watch them. It's often just a snort or a huh, something like that. Very small, brief, but an acknowledgment that, yeah, that was funny. That's not unique to that. That's, that's an important milestone for how we begin to triage what should be let out loud <laughs> versus kept to ourselves. And that's a circumstance where that um, ability to keep a laugh to yourself 
is lost or not ever developed in, for instance, patients with autism who really never have the non-vocal exhalation-based laughter. People overestimate their ability to rationalize why they're laughing. Uh, it remains, even in adults, mostly involuntary. And in observational studies, 95% of laughter is non-comedic. So most of what we laugh at is really stupid. Uh, and if you're on the elevator and someone's joking about oh, uh, miserable weather, <laughs> yeah, it's miserable, but it's not particularly funny. But that's the bulk of what we see if we were to observe people walking around in terms of how they're laughing. This is a great gift, by the way, for, uh, it's a pie face game. That's cream on a little, <laughs> on a platter. And that's a spinner. And grandpa gets, you know, three spins. And he has to turn this knob. And it, anyway, it's, it's a fun game. So speakers. <laughs> laugh 46% more than their audience, and only 10 to 15% of their talk was thought to be objectively funny, at least per Dr. Provine, who's one of the few people who's really studied observational laughter. And if you can ever read some of his reviews, they're really beautifully written. So don't cut me some slack if what I say isn't particularly funny. Uh, Morrissey, the pop singer, has a song, That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore. He takes himself extraordinarily seriously. There's an example of a not funny joke. Anyway. Wait, what? If I'm laughing at stuff that is not funny, why am I laughing? Well, it turns out it betrays interest. It's a social glue. It's about 30 times more likely to happen in a group rather than when you're alone, and forms a kind of social punctuation. In the past, we are talking about just idea punctuation, but now it forms in adults a social punctuation. Are you part of the group that's laughing, or are you excluded? Furthermore, is there an agenda to the laughing? Uh, meaning the laugh may not be honest. OK, so here's the little joke I tucked into the front slide, the, the laughing violinist. He's actually showing the European version of the bird. You know, if you go like this, this is a curse. And he's laughing. He's hurling an insult here. So he has an agenda there to hurl an insult and laugh at someone. Where is that agenda perhaps most noted? Uh, Dimorphism, so male-female responses. It turns out women laugh more than men. Men apparently get more laughs, but women laugh more at men than other women, but not vice versa. If a woman laughs with or at a man, hopefully with, not at, the greater her interest in her conversational partner, and the more likely the woman is to laugh, the more the man is interested in her. Obviously, these are sort of based on heterosexual uh, observational studies, so they're a little bit biased. But on the other hand, personal ads reflect this. And I'm not speaking from experience here. I'm just quoting Dr. Provian. Women seek man who likes to laugh. Man describes himself as funny. There, there are different sexual preferences in laughter and how we use it that imply, because of a sex difference, that there are mating behaviors linked to how we appreciate laughing. So here's a joke. Tickle monster. Quick tickling me. It's not funny. It's pathologic. Where, so let's, let's pivot now towards our epilepsy patients. Uh, where are these zones involved in laughter located anatomically? So these are from refractory epilepsy patients. What I do, by and large, is treat people with hard-to-treat seizures that don't respond to medications. We treat them with surgical means, with stimulators, with all kinds of things. And part of our workup to figure out how best to treat them often involves going on fishing expeditions, looking for zones that generate seizures that are hard to determine based on scalp monitoring alone. So some of the data we're going to look at involves intracranial stimulation-based studies that help us map out pathways. So we'll look at some laughter pathways that are also independent of epilepsy and laughter due to seizures. And in general, when I'm reviewing this, it's going to get a little bit busy because there's seven patients to discuss. We're going to go through fairly quickly. But if you can keep in mind, we're going to move anteriorly to posteriorly, typically along the midline in these examples, to illustrate some of the important anatomies for laughter. So patient one. This patient had nocturnal hypermotor clustered seizures with little to no scalp signatures for her events. Um, 
these had gone on for years and were becoming increasingly hard to treat. And she would cluster and end up in the ER and end up hurting herself. And I was extremely nervous she was going to end up with a case of SUDEP or sudden death in epilepsy, because nocturnal convulsive clustered seizures are a high risk for that. We were in the process of surgically working her up and arguing where to place the bulk of our electrodes. And what you see on this scout film is electrode locations for this patient when we did her intracranial monitoring. So these are directly placed on the brain surface. What clued us in and perhaps more of her localization was a rather freak accident where she was involved in a carbon monoxide poisoning and brought to Virginia Mason and put in the hyperbaric chamber there. And during that hyperbaric dive, where the partial pressures of oxygen are blasted very high to help kick off the carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin, during that dive, she had a seizure and was left with a left postictal Todd's paralysis, which was unique. We hadn't really seen that before, which implied the bulk of her seizure activity was right hemispheric. The fact it was nocturnal meant that it was probably frontal. So it let us concentrate more on frontal tissues anterior to the um, motor, primary motor cortex. So we placed this array of electrodes overhead. And here's your wake up slide. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> there's the brain. There's 64 contacts uh, grid. That's what it looks like when we're doing these operations surgically. Uh, this isn't that same patient, but it gives you an idea of, of how much work goes into placement of these electrodes. Here's a schematic of her, her array over the right uh, frontal. The right frontal polar has a strip electrode. There's a strip moving down from that access hole towards the right temporal. This is an inferior view of the right temporal. There's a contralateral depth electrode, because uh, one of her scalp studies, there was some suggestion she might have a left hippocampus spiking. And she also had intrahemispheric electrodes placed, which are this sort of arced shape here, superimposed uh, behind the grid here. So a lot of electrodes, a lot of work placed in this lady's head to try and figure out where her seizures are coming from. So we were able to find where her seizures were coming from. And in that schematic, her seizures were coming from way down the front, right frontal, so way down here. And in the process of working her up and trying to figure out how much tissue can we safely take, we end up mapping patients. So mapping means we use a small degree of current through those same electrodes at the bedside and stimulate while the patient is awake. And we ask them a bunch of questions and or see what they do. So we can pick up various pieces of information about that mapping. One of them is, where is the motor sensory strip for the hand, which represented way up in the back part of the grid? Uh, where is the motor sensory representation for the leg? Again, way behind the uh, zone of seizure onset. And then we marched forward, mapping out whatever's in between to find out what happens. Because we want to get a big chunk of tissue out, big chunks of tissue out of brains tend to do better with seizure control later. So we want to figure out what's the back end or the posterior margin of our resection cavity going to be. So as we marched forward, we were able to stimulate an area in her right intrahemispheric cingulate sort of region where she had problems expressing herself, thinking of song words, and spontaneous laughter that was completely reproducible. <laughs> it was super fun, actually. We'd tell her a really bad joke. She wouldn't laugh. We'd tell her another really bad joke, and then we'd stimulate, and then we'd laugh, and then, anyway. It, it, was, it was quite an interesting mapping, because when you come across this, it's a little bit unexpected, but fascinating nonetheless. So we knew then that this was not an area that we'd want to hurt or harm. It was well away from her seizure onset. And we moved towards uh, resection. We took out the right tip of her frontal lobe, this circle is basically where that laughter zone was. And we left that in place. And I was nervous that post-operatively, she would have a lack of humor or not laugh. But I could hear her laughing outside of the room as I was rounding on her on post-op day one. And I was extremely relieved, because this was one of the aspects to her personality that we definitely wanted to leave in place and not harm. She's seizure-free now, 18 months out, which is a really terrific outcome for her. 
So patient two, this outcome was not so terrific. Um, this is a, one of our extraordinarily hard to treat patients who has a super refractory multifocal epilepsy. I inherited him after multiple surgeries were done on him. He had a progression of his epilepsy types over time to involve drop seizures uh, where he would collapse, fall straight back. He fell straight back in clinic once while checking out and smacked his head, ended up with a subdural and being admitted, and this kept happening over time. So he had potentially fatal, life-threatening atonic-tonic seizures where he was accumulating deficits because of them and not responding to, I believe, five or six meds we had him on, as well as the vagus nerve stimulator. So in that circumstance, when we have someone who's non-VNS responsive with drop attacks, we'll often use a corpus callosotomy to help their control of seizures. The corpus callosotomy is a surgical technique where we split or cut the anterior two-thirds of the corpus callosum, which link the left and the right hemisphere. And the thinking behind that is that the corpus callosum basically permits a rapid spread of seizure activity from one hemisphere to the other. If you cut it, that spread can occur, and the seizure may be stuck in one location, but not spreading to the degree where it causes a sudden loss of tone. Well, it worked. It worked in treating his tonic seizures. The corpus callosum stopped those dangerous, life-threatening seizures. But the consequences of that callosotomy were really marked and really abhorrent in some ways. He had a marked abulia. He was very flat in his affect, very unmotivated. He had a limited ability to mimic. He had an alien limb phenomenon where one hand would do something that he wasn't really uh, controlling unless you pointed it out to him, and then he'd sort of take over. Um, he had a difficult time engaging. He had problems sustaining attention. He would chuckle. There was sort of a conversational chuckle, but there really wasn't the mirth and laughter you'd associate with a normal adult interaction, certainly not what he had preoperatively. So by destroying those anterior corpus callosum fibers, we basically altered his ability to interact and determine the agenda that was a, a, a part of our conversational play. He was no longer able to do that. So a frustrating outcome for us, and one that suggests to me that if you cut the callosum, you're going to potentially have a big problem with determining the construct and grammar and punctuation of an interaction between an adult. You can't focus. You can't attend. You can't mimic. You can't determine what the person is doing and why they're doing it in ways that are uh, normative for most of us. So patient three. This is an extraordinarily interesting patient as far as I'm concerned. So what we have here is a diffusion MRI. It's a, it's a, a relatively run-of-the-mill left MCA, large left MCA stroke. So this is what a, an acute stroke looks like in the blocking of the left middle cerebral artery. I follow him for post-stroke epilepsy. He comes in now and then to the inpatient service after missing or forgetting a dose with convulsive seizures. He's watched for 12 to 24 hours and typically just boosting his meds up, we can get him back out of hospital. He's a fantastic gentleman. He's got the expected pyramidal compromise that you would see for a left MCA stroke. He's weak and spastic on the right upper, greater than the lower extremity. He uh, has an aphasia. He can receive a little bit of language, but he produces no recognizable language, at least from my point of view. Though his wife, in his communication of his stuttered, repetitive, head nodding, pu pu ma ma ba ba sort of words, can divine his intent and interacts in a level that seems rather sophisticated in ways that uh, are, are totally remarkable to me. But what's really interesting is much of that intent and communication comes in the form of laughter. He's always laughing the entire clinic visit. He's laughing appropriately at times when you would expect someone to laugh. We swap as best we can fishing stories. He laughs at my fishing stories. Maybe, again, that's involuntary and non-comedic. But um, his quality of life, as much as you'd assume that a left MCA was devastating in terms of your loss of ability to produce or receive language effectively, his quality of life is actually rather good. He and his wife get along well. They share a lot of jokes. They seem to have fun. He doesn't seem depressed at all. Um, they're sexually active. And I guess the point of 
bringing this up is a lot of times we'll see a patient with a large MCA stroke and counsel family and other wise that the quality of life is going to be miserable. Not necessarily the case. Why am I illustrating this in this talk? Well, you can block out or chunk out this entire region of language production greater than uh, reception. You can damage it and still preserve laughter. So laughter, back to that argument, well, laughter processes are more likely going to be midline and not necessarily involving a lot of uh, motor speech production pathways. For instance, illustrated here is damaged. So it turns out that laughter is preserved in patients who have bilateral speech motor region damage. Let's skip on to next patient, patient four. So what's the problem with this scan? Anyone see anything weird on this scan? If you can, just shout it out. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, the frontal sinuses are a little asymmetric, but that's not the abnormality. And uh, the abnormality is here. It's a hypothalamic hamartoma. And this is a classic board question. If you're doing your neurology or neurosurgery boards, this question pretty much comes up all the time. A gelastic seizure is a laughing seizure. And the most likely answer to where does a gelastic seizure originate is going to be in a hypothalamic hamartoma. So we're still sticking with midline. Hamartoma is just a, a kind of non-cancerous growth. It often occurs early. Um, in this patient, he had nocturnal laughing at age five that the parents blew off and didn't think of much, but later went on to develop, blew off is probably unfair. He later went on to develop really tricky, hard to treat seizures and status epilepticus, was airlifted multiple times from Vashon to uh, Seattle for treatment. And it wasn't until he was in his 20s when we were sitting in an epilepsy conference and we're looking at his scans and John Henson says, oh, by the way, do you guys know about this? And he circles the hamartoma. And that hamartoma is what was triggering his seizures. Those hypothalamic hamartoma patients often have uh, stimulus independent lapping with a irritability and depressed mood. They progress to refractory epilepsy, complex partial seizures, spasms, convulsive seizures. They may have a precocious puberty meaning that the hormonal releases from the hypothalamus, which in turn drive pituitary hormone releases of LH and FSH, are corrupted. This particular patient did not have precocious puberty, but he was, uh, he's, he's short and thin in ways that his parents' parental height suggest he probably ought to be taller. So there probably were endocrine changes, but subtle ones. He went on to have a laser coagulation uh, treatment, meaning a tip of a catheter was pushed all the way down to the hypothalamus. The tip of the catheter has a small laser on it. The laser is turned on and pulled backwards. And when it's on, it thermal coagulates tissue and damages it permanently. That treatment's been entirely successful for him. He's seizure free. Um, he's working. He's doing great. Just really a wonderful outcome. But this is the classic gelastic seizure. That's the term for a a uh, seizure that involves laughing, a hypothalamic hypertoma. So the flip side to that, if you're really going to get granular on board questions, is a dacristic or dacristic seizure, which is a crying seizure. Does anyone know where they come from? Dacristic or dacristic seizures, uh, by and large, the majority of them are, based, are, are found in patients with pseudo seizures or non-epileptic events. When they're epileptic, they can come from a variety of locations, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and hypothalamic hamartoma. Patient five. His seizure types were one of which was gelastic. He had laughing events, non-mirthful. He looked somewhat pained. He would cough and laugh at the same time. He also had different seizure types, stuttering speech, body jerking. Uh, a a third type where his right face pulled and became aphasic and confused. A fourth where he secondarily generalized or convulsed. He had a prior surgery at Harborview. That's just illustrated here on this left lateral temporal region. 
Um, we ended up re-monitoring that region with intracranial electrodes. Again, a grid placement over the lateral temporal and lateral frontal, uh, some subfrontal strips, some subtemporal strips, a hippocampal depth is that straight line that I'm pointing at there. An array of electrodes placed over zones we thought from his scalp monitoring that might trigger seizures. And it turns out his gelastic seizures were originating in the mid to inferior temporal lobe over these contacts. This is a subtemporal view, so there's a strip tucked underneath this temporal lobe. So anything green there was associated with a gelastic event. So he ended up getting a resection of that location, illustrated here. He doesn't have gelastic seizures anymore. He's got a preserved ability to laugh at appropriate times. He's gone on to have occasional psychogenic pseudo seizures, but those have seemed to stabilize over time. And the reason I'm presenting this is you can have gelastic or laugh-based seizures that occur temporally, independent of hypothalamic hamartomas. Patient six, what's wrong with this scan? Well, I'm, I'm going to spare you here. There's, there's not a whole lot wrong with this scan. Perhaps some changes slightly around the thalamic junction here. But this is a scan of a patient with autism. So autism is associated with epilepsy, depending on what you read. About 5 to 35 percent of patients with autism have seizures. It's probably uh, on the in my experience, it's probably on the higher end there rather than the lower end, in part because we don't look for it carefully or frequently. That's a tricky pa patient population to get an EEG on. In this patient, he had um, slow wave sleep, spike and wave discharges, and left temporal seizures. Um, he laughs in response to slapstick and violence. He enjoys that, but in terms of more sophisticated, uh, clues to laugh or associative or memory-based clues, he doesn't laugh at those. When you think about autism, a lot of theories are thrown out. One is that too much stimulus. They can't discern stimuli patterns and can't parse out what's important versus what's not. Second theory is one of empathy failure. They can't read or appreciate the emotions of others. Third theory is termed mind blindness. Sort of sim All of these are a little bit similar as far as, I, as far as I feel, where they can't see the intent of others. I think when you put it in context, though, of those infantile videos of the kids interacting and determining a grammar of interaction, a punctuation of turn-taking, idea encapsulation, threat versus non-threat, it becomes more interesting thinking about the autistic population specifically. How is it that they can't do that nearly as effectively? What structural rearrangements or failures have they had where they can't appreciate these stimuli and classify them as threat or non-threat, where they can't parse out and ignore distractions, um, and where they can't see emotional valence and emotional responses in others? Um, I'm not saying all autistic patients have those problems, but there's very many when you see folks in clinic with hard epilepsy and autism, it's often the case that there's very little interaction that plays along normal social reactivity. And I wonder whether it's those same midline frontal pathways that are corrupted or failing there. In some ways, the patient that we did the corpus callosotomy on ended up in a state very similar to what we see in autism. Patient seven. Um, her seizure types, whole left hand tingling, a fairly rapid progression to extension of the left arm, flexion of the right arm, stiffening of the upper body, extension of the neck, grimacing of the face, pulling of the lower lip to the left side. So all of that suggesting a probable right hemispheric onset, uh, followed by upper body trembling, unresponsiveness, and amnesia. The uh, behavior return is quick implying that it's probably frontal, meaning when we see frontal lobe seizures or frontal or parietal, we see behavioral returns that are fairly quick, whereas temporal lobe seizures tend to have a delayed response or return to normal behavior. Her MRI is interesting. She's got a prior surgical defect here, but surrounding it, there's a number of changes. These are inverted images. I like inverting the images because they often illustrate dysplastic tissue a little bit better, I find. There's a lot of cortical dysplasias in this lady's brain. 
multiple sites. So one of the advances over the years in what we do for these intracranial monitorings is the movement away from those multi-electrode grid and strip studies that we looked at in some of the earlier patients towards what's called stereo EEG. This is a procedure where we drill small burr holes in multiple locations and pass an electrode into deep structures of the brain that we're considering as candidate zones for seizure onset. It gives us a unique chance to map out networks rather than just cortex. The grid placed on the cortex gives us just an idea of what the superficial layers of the cortex are doing. The stereo EEG gets us an idea of, well, how broad and vast is the network of seizure? So for someone who has multiple deep-seated cortical dysplasias at the bottom of sulci, the stereo EEG becomes a much more attractive way of looking at monitoring that patient. So here's a schematic of some of those electrodes passed, uh, not schematic, a, a, a CT views of some of those electrodes passed to give you an idea of what they look like. And here's the schematic of where we placed electrodes. The tail of the electrodes is gray. The head of the electrodes is dark. Um, and you can see multiple locations were covered. During her monitoring with the intracranial stereo EEG electrodes, we were able to find uh, her majority of subclinical seizure and most frequent seizure onset site was off one of these right parietal depths. She had other sites, too, that developed seizures. Each one of those colors is a slightly different flavor of her seizure. So in the process of those stereo EEG placements, we were able to map her. Mapping a network is, is, in some ways, you really don't know what's going to happen when you're mapping those deep structures. In the cortex, you can get a sense, oh, I should be close to hand motor. I should be close to hand sensory. But when you're deep in a parietal depth electrode, it's really a little bit bizarre as what you might find. So in mapping her, we were firstly, first of all, interested in finding where her hand motor and speech motor locations were, because that's one area we would not damage or resect or ablate. We don't want to give someone new problems with speech or motor. We're able to map out where hand sense and motor was in the parietal. So motor, hand, sense, hand. We're able to map out laughter and polka dot sensations and laughter sensations on her deep parietals close to midline. And that laughter wasn't a mirthful laughter. It was more like a sensation of tickling or sudden surprise that, that was not unpleasant that made her want to giggle and laugh. So we were able to find another zone where laughter can, prov can be provoked by stimuli. To give you an idea of the tools, the, the surgeons have to play around with their localization. This is sort of the uh, summated view of which electrodes were triggering laughter in multiple different angles. So between the green and yellow dots here are where we were mapping out laughter for her. So where have we found laughter, or what clues do we have for laughter's anatomy? So one is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamic hamartoma gives us an example of a deep midline pathway closely regulating timing and presumably very intimately associated with uh, midbrain and brainstem uh, respiratory controls as well. Parietal sensory paths, either reflexive, a tickling-like sensation, or a cognitive self-awareness uh, in that last patient close to midline. The anterior mesial frontal or cingulate on the right side in the patient who had the carbon monoxide poisoning. A temporal zone uh, in the patient with uh, temporal gelastic seizures. Not necessarily from dominant receptive or expressive language regions, though. And furthermore, obliteration of associative laughter with anterior corpus callosal damage. So a variety of locations, but the general thrust of those locations is most of them are going to be close to midline, especially if you have an early onset epilepsy associated with laughter. But later onset can be a little bit tougher, almost anywhere in the frontal and temporal, but again, still linking into final common paths that trigger laughter that are presumably going down to the brainstem. So big picture, I used epilepsy as a way to 
read about and think about laughter. But I think for neurologists and those of us interested in mental illness, there's all kinds of strange clues left by laughter in various disease states. So pseudo-bulbar affects, for instance, where someone can't control their crying or their laughing and laugh at a drop of a hat at something that's not appropriate uh, or crying similarly. In narcolepsy and cataplexy, you can have a sudden emotional laugh or stimulus that immediately triggers a loss of muscle tone. In frontotemporal dementia, you can see a, a complete loss of sense of humor and a very flat affect. In Alzheimer dementia, you, you can often see a, uh, a, a kind of generally unfunny giggling or laughing, uh, kind of like the elevator conversation about weather. Not terribly sophisticated, um, but conversationally pleasant and not inappropriate necessarily. In Parkinsonian dementia or Parkinson's disease, and I sort of picked the brains of Rosa and, and um, Jenny and Susie about this. Uh, per Susie's version, the Parkinson's patients are funny, do laugh a lot, have a great sense of humor, but they can't express it motorically. They can't bring it out because of their masked faces uh, and motor inhibitions there. Um, Post-traumatic injuries often have a uh, robust, inappropriate laughter with a complete lack of grammar to when they should and should not laugh. Depression, inappropriate laughter and crying. Angelman syndrome. Angelman's is a genetic disorder where the kids uh, look extraordinarily happy and, and seem to laugh quite a lot. The, the sort of fallen out of favor term for it used to be happy puppet syndrome. But when you see kids with Angelman's or adults with Angelman's, they do look extraordinarily happy and they do laugh at a lot of things. And similar of two patients I have with Angelman's or, or I've worked with or talked with their families about, their laughter patterns are a little bit similar to the autism patient I was talking about before. Both find uh, violent slapstick extraordinarily funny. Go figure. Um, one of them was really into chainsaw movies. Um, what else? Laughing gas, alcohol, amytal, marijuana, the chemical suppression or induction of a laughter state, uh, presumably just through lowering of inhibitions, psychiatric disorders, developmental failures. The class clown, as far as I'm concerned, can be a red flag, especially if they don't grow out of it. Is that person suffering from attention issues? Are they failing to read cues of the group? Are they making the jokes that then turn into ostracization as they move into uh, middle school and later? Uh, the bully who doesn't understand humor. I mean, there's all sorts of aspects about humor and laughter that can give you ideas about failed pathways and states that I think are important for us to consider. Sometimes we get all wrapped up in, well, when does language develop and when do they walk? But I think there's a lot of framework that occurs well before that in terms of grammar, of intent, and interaction that laughter helps punctuate and perform uh, for social cohesion and interactions that um, is, is fairly easy to, to ask about. It's very easy to ask about. And uh, I've started asking way more people about it because it, it's fun. And it breaks the ice. And patients and families get into it. They, they, they really uh, appreciate talking about it. So this, tying things up, this is a busy slide, but these are some of the other locations where stimulation studies have shown laughter. And a lot of them are anterior limb of internal capsule or temporal lobe or inferior frontal gyrus. Uh, so there are published reports from a lot of um, generally epilepsy groups on where laughter was elicited. Um, it's rare to see laughter elicited from the thalamus. The thalamus is not a funny organ. You can get mood issues and sadness, but, but rarely laughter. Um, similarly, negative emotional states have been mapped out. And there's probably not enough time to go into this. But that's where I wanted to end. And thank you for your time. Are there questions? Mark. <laughs>